While I often use ThinkPads for my computing needs, there are times when I need a little bit more horsepower for what I'm doing, and I turn to a desktop. My keyboard of choice for typing up scripts and long essays and anything like that is the trusty IBM Model M. This keyboard popularized the now standard desktop layout that is mostly still used today, and its buckling spring key switches are often regarded as among the best out there for long typing sessions. And best of all, you can still buy one today, albeit without the IBM branding, from a company known as Unicomp. However, while the Model M is an excellent typing keyboard, it isn't the best keyboard out there for gaming. It requires a lot of pressure to push down the keys, and during longer game sessions, this can become a source of fatigue. Additionally, the Model M doesn't have N key rollover. Most of the time, this isn't a huge problem, and for casual games, it really isn't an issue. But for serious gamers out there who are going to be pressing down a bajillion different keys at once, it can be just enough of an issue that it's annoying. For these reasons, I purchased this Gigabyte K83 keyboard about two years ago. Unfortunately, it is no longer made, and prices on them have gone up across the board. But when I purchased this, I only paid around $40 for it. Most of these were available with Cherry MX Red switches, but you could also get them with Cherry MX Blue switches, which is the one that I got. It's amazing to find a keyboard from a reputable manufacturer with real Cherry switches for such a low price. The build quality is decent, with a thin but strong metal backplate, and it has rear feet on the bottom that adjust the keyboard height. The keycaps are cheap laser-etched ABS plastic, so the texture and the lettering wear down very quickly. However, I do like the lettering that they chose to use on the keycaps because it isn't one of those really hideous-looking gamer keyboard fonts that you often see. While I mostly stick to my Model M for typing, the K83 is a fairly nice gaming keyboard if you can get a hold of one. The better quality mechanical keyboards out there typically last longer than their rubber dome counterparts. Additionally, if a mechanical switch breaks or wears out, it can be replaced individually without having to replace the entire keyboard. In my case, the Gigabyte keyboard I have was victim to a fall a few months ago, causing the left control and windows keys as well as the spacebar to stop working. As you can hear, the control and windows keys don't even have an audible click anymore. Some mechanical keyboards let you replace the switches just like you would replace a keycap, but for this keyboard I'm going to have to pull out a soldering iron. I have a soldering iron, but it was junk, and it didn't work very well, so I was in need of something a little bit better. Recently I was out in Columbiana, Ohio, and found a shocking sight, an honest-to-god Radio Shack store that was actually open. All of the ones in my area closed several years ago, so this was a welcome sight to see. Since I was in the market for some new soldering equipment, I went inside and purchased a basic station along with some extra solder and wick. Could I have gotten something better online for a lower price? Probably, but coming across a Radio Shack store that's actually open is increasingly rare, so I figured I might as well buy something while there's still one around. I was thinking about making this trip into its own video, but I was pressed for time that day and I didn't get a lot of footage. Back at home, it's time to get to work on this keyboard. Before we take it apart, I'm going to plug in my soldering iron and turn it on so it can begin to warm up. These irons can get anywhere from 400 to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, so you definitely want to keep anything flammable away. You also don't want to hurt yourself off of one of these. Have you ever been accidentally burned by a glue gun? Yeah, this would be a million times worse. Every keyboard is going to be a little bit different in how you take it apart and access the switches but the process usually isn't super complicated. I should also preface this by saying I am by no means a soldering expert, and there are probably better ways to achieve what I did in this video. But if I can successfully replace the switches in this keyboard, then anybody should be able to. Getting my K83 apart was fairly easy. There were six Torx screws holding the backplate to the base of the keyboard. Two of them were hidden underneath the keycaps, so I had to pop these off to get the screws out. Some of these keycaps I had to take out anyway to replace the switches underneath. After all of the screws were removed, I lifted up the backplate with the keys attached and moved the base off to the side. Turning the keyboard over, we can see this large circuit board with a lot of solder connections. At first glance, this can look very confusing, but thankfully every switch is marked on the motherboard so we know which switch goes to which key. Two legs from each switch are soldered to the motherboard, providing the necessary connection for the key to work. Most places I looked at online said to apply the solder wick to the old solder on the pin that we're going to remove, and then press the hot iron to it. This should melt the solder and allow it to adhere to the solder wick. Some people have said that you'll probably have better luck with a solder sucker. I don't have one of these, so I just use the soldering wick. But I didn't have very good luck with this. The solder simply did not want to adhere to the wick itself, even though there was no issue with getting the solder hot enough to melt. 
However, after some patience and some fiddling around with the solder wick, I was able to get enough of the old solder off of the board that I could pop out the old switch. Interestingly, once I had popped out the old switch, I had a much easier time using the solder wick to remove the remaining old solder. The job certainly isn't perfect. Like I said, I'm not an expert at this, but it looks pretty good to me now. After taking out the broken switches, I wiped down the areas on the board that I was working on with some alcohol. Now I'm ready to put in my new switches. I have some replacements here that I ordered online. In my case, some new MX Blues. The replacement switches pop into place fairly easily. The plastic center holds them in place, making it very easy to apply the new solder to the pins without having to hold the switch in place. Applying the soldering iron to the pin and letting a small drop of solder melt into place did the trick, just enough to secure the connection between the pin and the motherboard. After repeating this process on the rest of the pins, we should be done. I flipped over the keyboard and put the keycaps back into place, and then plugged everything in to test the keyboard out. And what do you know? The keyboard now fully works again, with every key being detected by the computer. So there you have it. This was a short video because it was just a quick weekend project that I wanted to share with you. I'm happy to have this keyboard working again for the occasional gaming session, and hopefully this can help a few of you out there if you ever come across a keyboard with broken switches. Having to solder might be intimidating for some people, but as I said earlier, if I can manage to get this keyboard working, anybody can. And in my opinion, this is a good beginner soldering project, because you have a lot of space to work, the switches hold themselves in place so you don't have to try and hold them as you're soldering the pins, and there's no really tiny surface mount components that you have to worry about. I have some more videos coming up that I'm excited to share with you, so be sure to stay tuned for those. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.